This episode is brought to you by Paraswap, the leading aggregator to find best prices across various DEXs. You'll hear more about them later in the show. I'm super excited for this episode. You've got, uh, for anyone watching on YouTube, you are in for a treat. Tom's got this beautiful view in London behind him. Uh, today we're sitting down with Tom uh, at Jane Street. Uh, Jane Street is, uh, as the, you know, not my words, uh, Financial Times' words. Article came out yesterday or, uh, last year, Jane Street, the top Wall Street firm no one has ever heard of. So that's, uh, I mean, quite, quite the title. The firm traded, I think, you know, I might be a little off on these numbers, between like 15 to $20 trillion worth of securities in 2020. So maybe a little outdated, including 10% of the entire U.S. ETF market and nearly 5% of the U.S. equity market. Um, Tom, you've been around... I think you joined Jane Street in like 2003, if my memory serves me correct. Yeah, today's actually, it's a momentous day. It's my 19th anniversary at work. <laughs> 19th anniversary. Oh, that's amazing. What do, uh, what do they do for you at work? What, what's uh, any like big uh, celebra- celebratory cake or anything like that? Hey, my ID still works. So uh, I assume that, <laughs> that is... That's um, all you need. Yeah. That's all that, you need. Yeah, that that's is awesome. all you need. That's great. All right. So kind of three parts of this conversation, though, these podcasts usually go off in some direction I have no idea about, but kind of just talking about the importance of financial markets, maybe from a more theoretical lens, then getting a little deeper into financial markets and how they actually work. And then I really want to, you know, you guys entered the crypto space a couple of years ago, pretty quietly. And so I kind of just want to explore what you guys are doing in, in uh, on the crypto side of things. But Tom, I think it'd be helpful for your uh, for just me to learn, like, can you just share a little bit about Jane Street? What is Jane Street? And maybe just like, Talk about the magnitude of what you guys are doing because you guys really are so quiet. You don't do much marketing. You don't do much PR. I think this is the first podcast you've you've ever gone on, right? And so I just want to kind of hear from you. Like, what is Jane Street? Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, there are so many ways I can screw this up. So, um, so thank you very much for for uh, for having me on. I'm really really excited about this. You know, to be in a virtual room with one of Forbes 30 under 30 is a real treat for me. <laughs> And obviously, what you guys are building in the space is really, you know, is really impactful. So I appreciate it. Um, but as for us, like Chase Street, we are, you know, uh, in, in simplistic terms, we're a uh, global multi-asset liquidity provider and market maker. Um, we did our first trade in the year 2000, um, but in the intervening years, you know, we've basically expanded to every asset class and you know product type in every market that we can kind of reasonably access. Uh, I think we're commonly associated with, you know, as you mentioned, ETFs, uh, equities, uh, bond portfolio trading. But really, those businesses were built on, you know, and continue to feed back into our expertise in other, uh, in, in other markets and other asset classes, such as crypto, which we'll talk about, I guess, later. Yeah, um, but, yeah I mean, uh, we... <laughs> I do know, I do recognize that we have a reputation of being quiet. Um, I think that, you know, we do try really, really hard to be a positive actor in, uh, in financial markets. You know, and in a lot of ways, you know, I see us very, uh, I see us as part of the plumbing of financial markets. And in a lot of ways, like, you know, you don't necessarily need to know how financial markets work in order to take advantage or avail yourself of the opportunities that are available there. You know, and so market makers in general, I think if we are doing our jobs right, then, you know, the way that you see us in the market is in things like tighter spreads, lower execution costs, um, deeper liquidity, uh, you know, when it comes to considering allocations, like a lot of people need to, uh, especially institutions, need to think about entry and exit points. Like, is the market deep enough for me to not only invest, you know, some portion of my assets, but also like... If I need to withdraw assets for whatever reason, can I do it quickly without, you know, with limited market disruption? And I think we play a big role in that. And so, you know, we do have a lot of really, you know, we do focus on positive sum interactions within the financial markets, but they tend to be more one-on-one. Like, we work with counterparties to help them understand, like, how they can achieve their investment objectives. And we talk to regulators about, like, what we're seeing in terms of, uh, especially in times of market stress, and, and, and share with them like our views. You know, we we work with a lot of infrastructure providers. We obviously work with big banks and prime brokers and, and people like that. Uh, we tend not to comment too much on public, uh, you know, publicly. But I think that you know, <laughs> there's not really a need for us to because there are some very vocal and very strong you know market makers who um, who have made it you know their goal to to try to publicize the role of market makers 
um, and to you know, advocate uh, on behalf of market makers. So I don't think that there's a lot that we can add to that discussion. But I think that we, you know, we try very hard to you know, build up these relationships and have these positive uh, interactions and essentially make the plumbing better. And so, I, you know, it doesn't feel like a huge surprise that people aren't necessarily familiar with us, like in the same way that, like, you know, you don't need to know who Akamai or Cisco is in order to, you know, take advantage, uh, you know, to participate on the Internet. You don't need to know what Akamai is or how DNS servers work and stuff. Um, and it's probably for the better, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> as long as yeah. we are there, you know, like, uh, hopefully, you know, market makers, their primary function is to, to assist in the formation of fair, orderly, and efficient markets. And in a lot of ways, like, if the markets are working well, there's no reason for you to be aware of us. And the fact that, you know, a lot of people don't it is probably proof that the, the, the markets are, are working reasonably well. Right. So there are two ways to make money in finance, right? Or two, ma two main ways. One is taking directional bets on things. Uh, I'm going long an asset. I'm going short an asset. I'm taking a bet on an asset, right? And I think that the way that a lot of people think about large Wall Street funds is in that way, right? They're hedge funds where they're saying, great, you know, Apple's trading at 100 bucks, Bitcoin's trading at 30,000 bucks. I think it's going up or I think it's going down. I'm going to go, I'm going to go long or short. You guys do something different, which is you do what you said is, you know, providing liquidity. You're known as a market maker. Can you just explain like what that business looks like and just what, you know, a day, a day in the life looks like of a market maker. Um, and just like, why, why, where you guys function in this so-called financial plumbing, like you mentioned? Yeah, sure. Um, I will, uh, I will make a small, or take small exception to, to, to the way that you're defining things, because I think we think of things a little bit differently. So when you think about any sort of trade, you think about it in terms of timescales. Um, and so if you compare somebody like some, you know, a market maker or a liquidity provider or somebody who's, uh, you know, who primarily, uh, you know, earns revenue by capturing the spread in markets, um, their time horizon on their trades is very, very, very short, as opposed to somebody like, you know, Warren Buffett, whose time horizons on his trades are very, very, very long. So I, I, th I instead of kind of um, directional bets versus kind of liquidity providing, I, I, I think that the easier way to think about it is just trades with different time horizons. Because, you know, a liquidity provider like us, I think there, are, there is a distinction between somebody who's a pure market maker. And, you know, a pure market maker is one who essentially sits on the bid and offer on each, uh, on a security. And let's say that, you know, if you have Microsoft, it's a penny wide, you know, the, the fair value of Microsoft is probably somewhere between the bid and the offer. And so essentially, a market maker, if they sit on both the bid and the offer, like if they buy, they're buying below fair value. If they sell, they sell above the fair value. And you know, those jo the, the job of market makers like that is to essentially bridge the gap between buyers and sellers. You know, like, um, and in the same way that somebody like Walmart is mostly a facilitator, and they kind of bridge the gap between people who, needs to, who need to buy certain things and people who need to, or who produce, and then are looking to sell those on. And so Walmart maintains some inventory, but essentially they sit in the middle between these buyers and sellers. And so the market makers are important because, you know, as, as I was talking about in terms of entries and exit points, if, you know, you need somebody who will be able, who, you know, if you have somebody who is willing to step in, in all market conditions, um, and stands ready to buy and to sell, you know, that is a valuable service. And I do think about ourselves as service providers, as, you know, as, as part of the plumbing. And the, the services that we offer that we kind of get, you know, compensated for are, are things like providing liquidity, especially, um, you know, in, in, when times are volatile or in assets that are hard to price or in things like, you know, emerging market uh, equities when, you know, the, the, the home market is closed, things like that. Um, in which case, the, the liquidity is important because it does bridge this time gap between buying and selling, the natural time gap between buying and selling. Um, but another thing that we do is we take on risk. You know, like if you think about somebody who is looking to buy, you know, they're lo looking to assume risk and they need somebody to take the other side. Or if you need to liquidate a position, you know, you need somebody to stand on the other side and buy when you're trying to sell. And so the assumption of risk, I think, is a, is a property that I think a lot of people, like very rightly, are, are, are willing to pay for. Um, and so that is, that's another pretty important component of what we do. And so do you always have to take the other, I'm, you know, I'm thinking that 
uh, the role of a market maker might not be that tough in times of uh, very liquid, just like not much volatility, right? It, it might not be the craziest job, but in times of like March of 2020, right, where uh, COVID's hitting, uh, things are going completely bonkers. I'm assuming that really stress tests the business. And if, if I understand it, you almost have you have to take the other side of the trade because that is the service that you're providing to your clients. Am I understanding that correctly? And like, uh, maybe take us back to like something like March of 2020. Like, was that a really stress tested time where you guys were like, mm -hmm. or was that a, take me back to those days? Yeah. I mean, that fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, I've been through quite a, a, a few kind of very disruptive periods. Um, March 2020, I think is a great example. Like, there are different levels of liquidity providers or market makers, and a lot of it is based on their risk tolerance, their, uh, you know, the, the amount of liquidity that they have, like their capital base. You know, at, at some point, if you get stopped out, then you, can't, you can no longer serve the function that, you, you know, that you're kind of supposed to do in markets. And uh, for March 2020, you know, fortunately, we had, at that point, almost 20 years of experience in financial markets. Um, we had built up our capital base uh, to the point that you know, we stood ready and willing and able to provide liquidity, especially on the bid side, uh, through most of the disruption. And if you are exclusively trading on exchanges, it's hard necessarily to see, you know, uh, who is the one stepping in. But we have a pretty substantial um, OTC counterparty network of large institutions that we use to face, you know, on a bilateral name basis in ETFs or equities or, or bonds. And I think that uh, in those times um, when institutions were looking for liquidity, um, we were, you know, we were up 100% of the time or virtually 100% of the time. And I would say that our ability to provide liquidity um, in the absence of other liquidity providers um, is reflected in the relationships that we have uh, with, those, with those counterparties, which I think is as, as strong as it's ever been. I'm trying to think about like this concept of just an efficient market, right? Or like the perfectly efficient market and, and different things come to mind, right? You obviously approach it from a very like liquidity uh, side of things, right? We, we are, we are always going to provide the liquidity. There are, there are other aspects to it, right? There's um, there are fees, right? If, if there are like uh, fees and maybe even high taxes on trades or something like that, let, let's imagine you have uh, like 2% fees on, on an exchange or something like that. If there's a if there's a price move that's less than two percent, there's not going to be a trade done, right? Um, on, on that sort of thing. There's also like a latency, right, and like the speed of things. So how do you think about? Um, I guess just how do you think about like efficient markets? But maybe a better question there is like, why do efficient markets actually matter? Why do we need these efficient markets? And like in the U.S., I guess I'd extend that to say like in the U.S. we have we have pretty efficient markets, like. Uh, the equities market works pretty well. Um, that's obviously probably one of the best examples. But even just other places like in goods and services, like Amazon, very efficient market. Walmart, very efficient market. Things like that. Music, right? There's very efficient market with like Spotify uh, connecting suppliers, the musicians and the artists to the listeners, right? The users. In other places of the world, maybe emerging markets, uh, markets are not as efficient. What does an inefficient market do, whether that's from speed or fees or taxes or no liquidity, what does an inefficient market do to an economy? Uh, well, I think mostly when you think about inefficiencies, you, you know, one easy way to think about them is, is in frictions. You know? And so if you think about a, you know, a reasonably frictionless um, product, you know, uh, and there, I don't think that there is one that kind of stands out. Certainly, if you look at you know uh, spoos, uh, spoo futures, like that's one of the most liquid uh, instruments in the world, or you know treasury futures, or, or, or things like that. Um, I do think that you know, in some ways, the market is so used to uh, the liquidity that is available in these products that when you see them thin out, you know, some people read that as a sign of stress. Certainly, there's a lot of articles now um, in the last few weeks talking about like how much more impact people have trading spoos now than they than they have in the past, and you know they're using it as evidence that there's a little bit of a breakdown. But uh, sorry to just to to widen out, I think to, to to what I think your question is. You know, I think frictions manifest itself in lots of different ways, um, and depending on how. How much friction there is, it can actually make the system break down. Um, you mentioned a lot of uh, a lot of them. Like if it is expensive to trade, then what ends up happening is market makers, like very rationally, or liquidity providers very rationally, will just widen out. You know, um, there's lots of examples of this. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, 
transaction taxes or short selling bans or things like that. You know, if you make it difficult to trade, like you can imagine if you put a 2% tax on every single transaction, then what will naturally happen is that markets, uh, market makers will react um, kind of rationally by widening their markets by 2%. And that's not always the case, you know, like once somebody does a trade, then it's cheaper to take it off. And so, you know, but basically you are setting a, a bound on kind of the net, uh, bound on the amount of liquidity that can be provided to the system. And so certainly latency, if, uh, you know, the latency race in certain cases uh, is really beneficial, um, but in other cases you can imagine where, you know, if you have a winner-take-all kind of philosophy, then it reduces the incentive for other people to try to compete. And then what ends up happening is that, you know, if you have a dominant force in the market, then they can kind of just set whatever uh, the market widths and market depths are um, just because they make it hard to compete. Um, fees, uh, you, you mentioned again, like if it is expensive, if market data is expensive, then uh, it is very natural for, you know, that to get expressed in spreads. And so we talk about this a lot. You know, there is lots of different ways when people talk about product structure, if you're designing a product um, that, uh, you know, you can think about different ways that, you know, the structure of your product is adding unnecessary friction. And certainly, like, <laughs> what's going on in crypto is like a pretty wonderful kind of sandbox for a lot of these different experiments. And you can see all of these different factors playing out, you know, and it's really um, interesting for, you know, product structure, market structure nerds like me, like to see all of the different experiments and then, you know, the unintentional consequences when you pull this lever and you actually say, oh, it actually raises, you know, it makes the market less efficient in this case and, and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, I, I hope it's pretty obvious, like what an efficient, what a frictionless market, like the benefits of, of a frictionless market, like um, another thing are things like, you know, tick increments, you know, like a lot of people, I, you know, it wasn't too long before I started Jane Street where equities st were still trading in, in, in fractions. And like, <laughs> you know, that is a very tangible uh, sign of how much so this more is like when you were quoting like when you were quoting an asset it's like apple's trading at like 105 bucks in like three eighths or something and three eighths or you know sixteenths or you know <laughs> things like that um and so you know something like uh tick increments or market spreads is a very tangible example of how much tighter or how ch much cheaper it is to execute now uh, than it was you know 20 25 uh, years ago and so Markets are tighter, it's cheaper to trade, um, there's more market depth, things like that. Yeah. Okay, I want to start getting into crypto and just actually comparing some of the market structure in crypto versus traditional <laughs> capital markets and also get into some of this unintended consequences because I'm sure there's a lot. Ooh, like, wow. I, I, honestly, it feels like uh, I think a lot of people have en entered crypto and are figuring out how traditional financial market infrastructure works yeah. uh, from, <laughs> from the, it <laughs> yeah, why it works the way it does, right? So I think when you look at crypto market infrastructure, let's go really wide, right? When you look okay. at just like the way that the system is getting created, what yeah. to you seems um, like, oh my God, that is, that is an innovation. That's amazing. For example, maybe 24 seven is the obvious one to me. Like it's crazy that equities don't trade 24 seven, but maybe there's an unintended consequence there. But what to you seems like, wow, that's a great innovation. It's so cool to see them doing this like this. And what to you feels like, oh my God, these guys have no idea what they're doing. And like, just they need to go talk to some traditional capital markets folks and figure out how this works because eventually they're gonna figure out the unintended consequences <laughs> of this. Give us the, your, your view on some of this stuff. Yeah. I, <laughs> um, yeah, it's really, really, really interesting. And it's one of the, my favorite parts of kind of digging into this, uh, it, it, digging into this market. Um, because, you know, I, I, and I see it both ways. Like, I do think that in a lot of cases, me having a background in traditional finance or in trading um, has made it actually harder for me to understand some of the crazy stuff that's going on in the crypto space. You know, and uh, and I've had to essentially kind of relearn a lot of what it means or, you know, why, you know, there's very legitimate asking of why do we need to do things this way. I think 24 seven is a great example of this. You know, one of the uh, one of the big innovations of crypto is this idea of t atomic settlement. Like you don't need to wait, you know, two days for for securities to settle. Like if you need cash, you can sell Bitcoin now and receive cash in your account, like uh, more or less immediately. Um, 
And, you know, it is having a big impact. You know, a, a few years ago, uh, um, the ASX, the Australia Stock Exchange, like uh, contracted with um, uh, Digital Asset, uh, which was run by B Blythe Masters at the time, to, you know, to... Uh, and to essentially blockchain this, the security settlement process, uh, chess. And, you know, I do think that that is going to, uh, the, the notion that inefficient processes like settlement is going to be improved over time, it seems to me, feels blindingly obvious now. Like, I'm not exactly sure how, but, you know, it, it is having an impact. You know, you see efforts to, like, expand trading hours of equities. Uh, you see, like, SIFMA just reported, a, uh, released a report saying, talking about transitioning from T2 to T1. Um, so, you know, you have stocks settling on a T1 basis instead of T2. Like, I think that that's probably a direct result of some of the innovation that's happening in crypto. Um, but when it comes to things that people are doing differently, you do see a lot of different efforts in the crypto space um, where they come up with systems that actually just look a lot like variations of, you know, traditional financial markets structures. You know, you see this a lot in the settlement side. And the settlement is particularly important because, you know, the, the big gaping hole in the middle of crypto trading right now is the lack of of either a prime broker or a credit intermediary, somebody who has enough balance sheet to sit in between and guarantee trades that are done like on multiple venues and multiple uh, in multiple areas. And so, a lot of people are attacking this in in, in different ways. You know, you have people who are d designing kind of settlement compression systems, which looks a lot like you know what CLS does in foreign foreign exchange. Um, one interesting thing that people that's come up is the idea of intercustodial settlement. Like you have all of your coins in custody, and instead of you like doing the settlement, that at the end of the day, like all the custodians kind of net settle against each other, which is exactly how precious metals uh, settle in in London. Like there are five clearing members in the LPMCL, and at the end of the day, they just net off exposures and send like the different requirements, uh, the you know the differences over. Um, I guess DeFi pools too, you could say like DeFi, these like permissioned fully KYC DeFi pools kind of look like just like FX ECM where there's like an accredited intermediary who just sits in between these people. Yeah, uh, that's, I, that's exactly right. And I do yeah. think that that's, you know, like it, it is very, very interesting. Um, and for those of you who don't know what FX ECN is, like that's the primary way that people trade uh, FX electronically. Um, and essentially what happens is that you know, you can o you are only able to see the price streams of people against whom you have credit, and then there's a credit intermediary, mostly an FXPB, who kind of steps in between. And you know, you can use an FXPB to access the you know the streams of multiple people because you know your FXPB has credit versus everybody else. And I 100% agree that looks a lot like you know permission uh, KYC D5 pools. Um, but you know, I do want to say that, like I said, a lot of my background has made it harder for me to enter, you know, to understand things, which is why you get, like, in retrospect, crazy statements like, oh, Bitcoin is worthless, coming from the head of what is now the biggest kind of <laughs> most engaged blockchain, uh, you know, product team uh, at, at any big bank. And, you know, for, for example, NFTs to me, I think, have, being a... Um, being a traditional financial guy, like NF it made NFTs unnecessarily difficult for me to understand. Um, and it took like a Paul at Damascus moment for me to actually get my head around why that might be useful. Um, so I don't want to be prescriptive and say, oh, just because you are doing something differently than you know how the traditional financial system is doing, that you're making some sort of mistake. Because I don't think that's true at all. Like I do think that, you know, over time the the, the innovation that is happening in DeFi is so exciting, you know? And uh, like what we are seeing to me is a great, great, great social experiment. It's like this idea of iteration, like DeFi is built on iteration. And this is something that we are very, very comfortable with because that's what we do. Like, you know, you experiment, you, you, you know, you run experiments, you do some tests, you come up with, you know, some hypotheses, you test the hypotheses. If it doesn't turn out, like, if the realized is less than, you know, the expected, then, you know, there's some tweaks and, you know, you kind of build it. And what we're seeing in DeFi is, like, just an iteration on a f global, massive scale that is fascinating to watch. Um, I, I do worry a little bit about, like, 
it is so easy to fork a program, uh, uh, fork code and create a new product um, that you're actually creating, it, you know, that has some kind of marginal improvement to it. And so that iteration is kind of a strict improvement versus kind of what existed before. But because a lot of these iterations are being governed by DAOs, like once you create this iteration, it actually, you know, having a DAO in some ways, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to critique DAOs because I think they're also an amazing governance tool, but needing to reach consensus of a DAO in some ways makes it harder to iterate on that project than it might have been, which means that if you want to iterate again, you can't do it within the project. You have to fork it <laughs> and do another project, which means that we have this, like, splintering universe of different projects that have different aims, and uh, I, I think that you see a lot of unintended consequences when it comes to, you know, some of these uh, some of these projects. Yeah, I love that. I mean, you mentioned this like road to Damascus moment, right? I, like, I think that, and just how you when you approach NFTs and crypto from this financial lens, it's almost harder. I completely agree with that, right? My co-founder Mike was a double major in psych and classics. I was a history major. If you look at a lot of our friends who've jumped into crypto, it's these like poli sci, classics, psych history. If you look at our friends who still think crypto is this like almost scam, it's the investment bankers and the private equity folks, right? And it's going to take them quite a while to understand that like this is actually this uh, changing system. Um, well, by the way, on, yeah. Sorry, Go when ahead. you talk about ahead. NFTs, like if you talk to NFTs and the first thing you just say to a trader is that they're non-fungible, like immediately a trader's mind turns off, right? Because a lot of the value that is attached with trade, you know, a, a lot of value that a trading firm or trader can add to projects, you know, just when it comes to price discovery and risk management and, you know, providing liquidity, things like that. If you say that something is non-fungible and it's one of a kind, then all of those benefits kind of go out the window. And so I think, uh, you know, it becomes very easy to say, oh, well, we can't really participate in that. And then you kind of uh, you know, you, if you get yourself into like <laughs> this feedback loop saying, oh, it's just a, you know, it's, it's a copy of a JPEG. What do you, you know, what does this mean? But, you know, I, it was actually, you know, it was actually Kyle Russell's post on loot that, um, that was my road to Damascus moment. Like just this idea that what NFTs actually represent is ownership, uh, is a digital record of ownership which is really, really, really powerful when it comes to intangible or illiquid, pro uh, I I illiquid products. And so, you know, for me, you know, the art and the music and everything else I think is really, really cool and it's a great way, you know, for people to get into it. But, you know, the idea of like having a digital, you know, those areas in which proving ownership is important, things like patents, things like copyrights, things like, you know, the real estate, you know, things like that. It, I think NFTs unlocks uh, an incredible efficiency gains when it comes when it comes to like processes that are full full of friction. So I'm really excited about the space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people miss the entire point of NFTs, which is N NFTs make content free while making ownership scarce. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And scarce ownership does a lot of really interesting things like digital scarcity. It, it impact like on the artists and musician side, it, it empowers them to make a lot more income, right? Without these ad based models, right? Which kind of eliminates or changes these uh, maybe exploitative models of Spotify, Apple, Amazon, et cetera. And this is a, obviously a massive shift and kind of just like flips the entire model that we've grown accustomed to uh, on its head, which is just a profound change, which is really, really interesting. 100%. And I think that that is consistent with the thesis of DeFi in general. Like having the ability, you know, and, you know, I, <laughs> we can go into Web3 later if you want, but, you know, this whole idea of having people take ownership of the things that, you know, that they actually created but didn't actually, couldn't actually monetize in the past, I think it's very, very consistent with that. You know, whether it's, you know, art, music, data, you know, your own personal data, you know, your financial transactions or whatever, I think that is very consistent with that. And I think it needs to be viewed in that lens, but that lens, you know, again, coming from a traditional institutional background can be very hard because it, re it represents such a huge paradigm shift that really requires you to kind of take yourself out of your history, like all of the, the, the knowledge that you've gained over the years about how, how systems work, 
and then kind of start from scratch. But once you do that, it's really, really, really exciting. Right, right. I want to go back to um, just like efficient markets and DeFi and liquidity and things like this. Sure. In one big change, one, uh, there are two big differences in crypto from traditional markets in my mind, right? My small brain, never been a trader, right? The, the two big changes that I see are like, one is in traditional capital markets, uh, the concept of a prime broker is just uh, like, every, it's all like, you don't need to think about like building a new prime broker and like no one has to worry about like, does the prime broker have a big enough balance sheet or maybe you, you do have to worry about it, but like that exists. Prime brokers exist in capital markets. In crypto, you've got all these companies popping up, and this was really the big trend back in 2018, 2019, is like you had to go build custody, then you had to build trading, then you had to build borrowing and lending, and build cap intro and all that stuff. And everyone in 2019 is like really hot to say we're building a prime brokerage. Uh, but it still doesn't fully, fully, fully exist in crypto, I would say. Maybe I'm wrong there. So that's one thing. The other is in crypto, we go direct to the exchange, right? If I'm trading, I go to Binance or FTX or Coinbase or Gemini, etc. Equities, you don't do that, right? I tried to go to NASDAQ, create an account to trade. I don't even think it exists, right? You go to TD Ameritrade or Schwab or Fidelity or something like that. And in traditional equities, you go, you know, you kind of go settlement and there's like all these layers, right? Settlement and clearing and ATS and prime brokerage and the exchange. And there's fees that sit in the middle of all that. Um, but in crypto, you go direct to the exchange and the fees are kind of inside, inside of the exchange instead of on, you know, through all of the layers. How does this... Um, how does that, like prime brokerage and maybe that capital stack, how does that change how you trade and how you find liquidity and how you manage risk as a trader trading both capital markets, equities and bonds and ETFs and whatever versus trading in crypto? How big of a difference is that? Oh, it's massive, massive. Um, and, you know, I, I think that you can debate uh, the value that intermediaries add. And I think that that's a very valuable and important debate to have. But it is unquestion it's, it's unquestionable that um, trading via a prime broker across multiple exchanges and, and multiple even products and things like that is orders of magnitude easier than it is in trading crypto. And I think that um, it is because the intermediary handles so much of the stuff that trading firms in crypto have to handle themselves. And so like one very obvious point is that, you know, if you want to trade in equities or let's say you want to trade, you know, let's say you're set up with a prime broker, you are trading in a bunch of different equities markets and you want to start trading futures so you can hedge. Like that is something that the, the prime broker makes very, very, very easy. Um, whereas if you are set up, uh, you know, if you are trading spot crypto right now and you want to trade uh, futures, um, and I'm taking CME out of it, but if you want to trade on a derivatives exchange, then you have to set up a new account at the derivatives exchange. You have to go through that whole onboarding. And then, you know, most crucially, you actually have to kind of take capital, make it captive on that exchange, um, and, then, uh, and then you can start trading. But... You know, in a prime broker, depending on the products that you're trading, like if you're trading, you know, a basket of, of, of S&P 500 equities and you're trading spoof futures, then, you know, the risk offsets and then there's like some capital, uh, you know, there's some haircut gains that you can do there. Whereas so the lack of a prime broker lock, locks up more capital in individual places, which therefore then potentially makes it harder to hedge against assets. Am I understanding that kind of logic correctly? Yes. I mean, <laughs> you're underselling your, your knowledge and experience here quite a lot. I think, yes, it makes it like the TLDR is it makes it much, much, much more expensive to trade crypto because you have a bunch of different locked pools of capital. And having locked pools of capital not only is expensive, like in terms of like, uh, you know, there's opportunity costs and there's funding costs and everything else. But, you know, the risk that is associated with not having the right capital in the right place is really um, it, it can be really really risky in in crypto because you know not you miss out not only do you miss out on good trading opportunities but like if in the event of like crazy market moves on a single exchange um, if you can't move assets to the right place then you run risks of getting like not being able to top up your margin getting you know product uh, products or positions liquidated like unintentionally things like that so you know having a, a prime broker who can, you know, who can essentially 
whether it is by funding uh, funding these pro you know positions themselves or by having credit at different exchanges like there's a, a few different models that you can use um, mitigates that risk somewhat um, and so I think that so in crypto it makes it very 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 expensive and it's also a huge barrier to institutional adoption by the way like if you have any sort of you know best X requirement but you're only set up on you know, on Coinbase <laughs> or something like that, and you know that you are subject to the price discovery and the liquidity and execution quality on a single exchange. Then, you know, you're you're not doing the right thing. But if you want to actually, you know, encompass the entire uh, universe of, of kind of liquid spot markets, then you have to open exchanges at a bunch of different places, in a bunch of different domiciles that aren't necessarily you know super friendly for for an institution to set up uh, set up accounts. So, yeah, uh, yeah it, it, it's a huge, huge friction uh, in the crypto markets right now. Yeah. And there, as you mentioned, there's lots of people who are trying to create prime brokers. Um, and, you know, a lot of them do offer some sort of credit or, you know, you, you post your capital at one place and then they extend limits uh, across multiple venues or maybe you can kind of net settle end of day. But the big thing that's missing is, is, is capital. And if you look at the fundraising of some of these, like, uh, you know, these, these prime brokers, like, you know, they probably over the course of, of different rounds have raised a billion dollars, and it, which is amazing, but it's, it's hard for people in the crypto space to actually understand that a billion dollars isn't even close to enough to actually run like a, a true legitimate like prime broker. Um, you have to have huge balance sheet. So that's, it feels like that's how, not going to change. How big, one yeah, I mean, how big is that balance sheet that they need? Like when you look at someone, you're like, oh, they have a balance sheet of a billion. And in crypto, they're like, great, we can create a PB now and we're good yeah. to go. And then you guys look at that and you're like, pat them on the head and you're like, that's cute. <laughs> If it was like ten billion, are you good? If it was a hundred billion, are you good? Do they need a trillion? Like, what are, what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, there's lots of different levers that prime brokers can pull to to mitigate the risk. You know, and and one of the reasons why you know prime brokers are successful is that you know uh, the good ones can mitigate the, this risk through various ways. You know, they can ask for more haircuts and they can you know funding and everything else or limit uh, set risk limits and things like that. But um, I don't know what the right answer is, but you know, like you can see examples in the traditional market, uh, traditional space, where like in the Archegos collapse, you know, one of the banks lost in excess of six billion, um, you know, because they, you know, they liquidated their positions uh, late, and so, you know, a six billion dollar loss would wipe out basically, you know, the capital base of a lot of, uh, of people in crypto. Yeah. So, you need to have yeah. at least that much. <laughs> yeah. Getting more into like how you guys are looking at crypto and your guys' activity in crypto. Actually, one thing that's funny, when I was doing a little prep for this podcast, I was uh, putting two and two together. Jane Street, I was like, I was like, oh, no. I was like, no, no one knows Jane Street. We got to maybe explain what Jane Street. And then I was like, oh, no, everyone in crypto knows Jane Street because Sam Bankman Freed, oh. it always like it's always like, you know, <laughs> SBF, like came over from Jane Street. Um, I'm curious, do people uh, is that is he like to talk a talked about guy? Uh, on the desk at uh, at Jane Street, or everyone's like, ah, no, we're not we're not talking about that crypto lunatic. <laughs> I mean, it's it's really hard to ignore what he's done, and you know, it's really yeah. it's incredibly impressive. So you know, you gotta you, you gotta recognize the the accomplishments when somebody um, actually legitimately changes the world. Um, so you know, like uh, I appreciate the fact that he talks about his experience here very positively. You know, I, I you know, and I do think that. Um, a lot of the things that he is doing, the culture of, 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 of the firms that he has, you know, maybe some of the external engagement stuff is a little bit countercultural, but in terms of like uh, the true passion it feels like people have coming to work um, every day, uh, and certainly how successful he's been, like, you gotta give him all the credit in the world. And by the way, yeah. Brett Harrison's another alum of ours that is doing, you know, is doing They really have a lot of James Street alum, yeah. It's funny. I was watching a YouTube video of like on the. It was I think it was like an intern video. It was like on the on the floor at Jane Street, like presented by some interns, and people were walking around with like no shoes, t-shirts, shorts, and I was like, oh man, this is Alameda. This is FTX. This is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, but 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 Tom, I want to like when I think about how you how you guys trade in like ETFs and equities and things like that, I would assume mm -hmm. there's kind of three places, right? Like there's like exchanges. Uh, maybe you're going direct to the exchange. Maybe there's like OTC, and maybe there's um. I don't fully understand like what this is, but like a single dealer platform where you're streaming prices. Um, yeah. And like those would be kind of the three venues. In crypto, 
are you going, is it, does it look pretty similar? Like, are you going just like, do you guys just like create a Coinbase account and like spin it up? Or like, or is it all OTC because the, the exchanges don't have enough liquidity or like, what is, what is, how does that look for you guys? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, so I think that there's a lot of different ways that we interact with the space. Uh, and so we started um, trading crypto in 2017. Um, and as you point out, there's a lot of different um in order to trade crypto, it means a lots of different things. So certainly we are set up, um, <laughs> we do have accounts at most of, uh, if not all of the kind of the spot and derivatives platforms, the big ones that you would imagine somebody like us uh, being. Um, we do have a large OTC institutional counterparty um, network. And so that's usually just limited by, you know, whether or not institutions can pass through our kind of traditional grade KYC and AML. So a lot of our OTC counterparties tends to be like, I don't know what the right way to say it, like a liquidity provider of last resort, or we are liquidity providers to liquidity providers. So if you are accessing crypto markets via you know, a retail broker or via like a flow aggregator or somebody like that, you might be interacting with, the, you know, with our prices. Um, and and just, you know, just so I fully understand that, like there are crypto market makers, like the... Mm -hmm winter mutes of the world. Um, I'm not saying you have to name who you're working with, but like the big crypto market makers. And then like you are almost their market maker of last resort if they need liquidity. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, I think there are, there's a pretty stark difference between crypto uh, market makers who are uh, who take principal risk and those who serve as agency. So I think the ones who would primarily be considered agency brokers or, or, or people like that, you know, who aggregate flow from lots of different places or people who advertise, you know, like, oh, we can access prices from lots of different price discovery venues, things like that. Um, <clears throat> we are probably set up at, at, you know, most of the biggest ones. Um, and the single deal platform is just, a, a, it is a streaming platform that we offer to select counterparties. Um, we're pricing dozens of tokens now. And so we're, uh, we're streaming two-sided um, firm quotes in all of these assets 24-7. Uh, um, but we still have a hand in the traditional markets as well. Like we're APs in like all of the crypto ETPs that are, have listed in Europe that have multiple APs. We can price uh, a, a wide variety of crypto ETPs that are located around the world. You know, we do derivatives trades. We do block trades on the CME. We do futures rolls. We can do EFPs. Um, we can offer things like reference price trades, TWAPs, VWAPs, um, things like that, um, because they, you know, the 24-7 nature of crypto has made it difficult to kind of create liquidity events. Like in, in equity markets, if you're trying to trade at, you know, quote unquote fair, you can look at the opening, the opening auction or the closing auction or an intraday auction. Um, and that's, those tend to have this like magnetic effect for liquidity. So people, if you want to pair off at, you know, a, at quote unquote fair price, you can do it at these, at these moments. Uh, crypto doesn't really have that. So um, if you want to do large blocks, um, you know, the, the easiest way to do it is probably over some long period of time. But it's, it makes it a little bit weird. Um, like institutions care a lot about uh, transaction cost analysis or TCA. And, uh, you know, like how well my execute or how good my execution was relative to like a VWAP or TWAP or a reference rate or something like that. And because, you know, the crypto markets are so dispersed, like it's actually hard to come up with like a formula for these are the indexes that we use to, to or these are the exchanges that we use to, to price the VWAP or anything like that. So it's an emerging thing, but if people need, you know, to, to access deep liquidity, then, you know, we're happy to work with them. Empire is proud to be supported by Paraswap. Paraswap is one of the leading DEX aggregators in crypto. Let's say you're booking a flight. You would never go directly to an airline, right? You'd never go directly to United or Delta. You'd obviously go to Google Flights or Expedia or Kayak or Booking.com. That's what Paraswap does for DeFi. Paraswap, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can see the platform. Paraswap makes swapping easier, it makes it faster, it makes it cheaper by aggregating more than 80 different DEXs. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, Uniswap, Sushi, Balancer, uh, Bancor into one single interface. You can use Paraswap on ETH, Polygon, as you can see here, BSC. They recently launched Avalanche a few weeks ago, pretty exciting. 
if you are a trader listening to this, you are losing money by not using Paraswap. And excitingly enough, if you're a company or a platform looking to access the swapping or the yield capabilities of DEXs, you can now use Paraswap's APIs to integrate into your platform to get the full power of the DEX aggregator into your platform. So head on over to paraswap.io. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see how simple it is to use. Just plug in, let's say I want to swap you know, 0.2 ETH. For USDT, you can see how simple it is. Just plug that in right there and it aggregates over 80 different DEXs. So head on over to Paraswap, P-A-R-A-S-W-A-P dot I-O to use the platform today. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, it's that. So like what you just mentioned is kind of like what I almost assumed you would mention, which is like, okay, CME and derivatives and you're getting involved in like some of the indexes and things like that. Uh, okay. And you've got your accounts at like the different derivatives and the spot exchanges. What I want, what I'm more curious about is, okay. um, is like deep DeFi and things like Ooh. that. Because if yeah. I am sitting in your shoes and I'm Jane yeah. Street or I'm just a fund in general, you know, right mm. now I'm getting like 60% APY on some things. And like if I'm a, if I'm working traditional capital markets, like, and I see something that's more than like 8% APY, I'm trying to get that all day and twice on Sunday, right? <laughs> but then the counter argument is that. The, it's very, it's very like actually the biggest counter argument is it's confusing as hell, right? You're in these things that are like named after like fish and animals and, and food and things like that. And you're like, this can't be real. And then the second thing is like, uh, there's just like not that much size that you can do in these things. And it reminds me of like 2017 and 2018 when Mike mm -hmm. and I would speak with a lot of the, the big funds. Uh, they'd yeah. be like, look, yeah, we want to enter crypto, but like if we put our, you know, the nail of our pinky finger into the into the asset class, yeah. the market will move 30 uh, percent. Yeah. And so we can't do it yet. And now that's, you know, the space has gotten bigger. But if you look at these DeFi protocols, that's it's still pretty, pretty darn small. So I'm curious what you guys are doing in some of this, like what I would call uh, the long tail or like sure. the deeper, uh, the deeper pools of, of crypto. Um, so the short answer is we are involved in DeFi but not as much as we would like and not as much as we will be in, you know, in months, years to come. Um, DeFi is difficult from an institutional standpoint because you know, if you can just hook up your wallet to any sort of AMM pool or lending pool or things like that, then it makes KYC or you know, your customer um, really, really uh, problematic. And so we have to be really, really careful you know, because of our relationship with regulators and, you know, and everything else in the way that we interact with them. But we recognize that there's, it is, oh, it's really fascinating. Um, so certainly we are trying very much to support the space. And you know, there's different ways that we do it. One is through um, token investments. Um, so we have started uh, doing some investments. It's a little bit hard to compete with the likes of people who can move so quickly and throw so much money at some of these. But you know, like we recently participated in the, in, in the, round, in the funding round for, for One Inch, for instance. And we are trying to work with um, people who are trying to build, uh, you know, institutional grade options in the space. Um, trading is a little bit less, is a little bit more problematic than something like DeFi lending pools. So we are talking to different um, providers in that space, like whether or not we could actually secure it. You know, like it's easier when you come to a lending pool of saying, okay, we have... Uh, Jane Street credit, where people are willing to pay for it. And then you can do a little bit more kind of due diligence on, on people in that pool than, you know, just kind of hooking things up. Um, uh, it's certainly some of the, the trading that is happening, like in the DOVs and things like that, like really, really fascinating stuff. Um, I, I think that we at some point will uh, get involved in that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's really, really interesting, especially like you talk about the APYs and this is really something that, uh, you know, that is fascinating to watch. Um, again, I don't think it's an institutional product because for lots of different reasons, we can talk about it there if you want, but you know, um, this is one of those kind of unintended consequences. Like, you know, this, this stuff like 3.3 and, um, and you know, uh, all the stuff that's going on from like Olympus down and, and people like that. Like if you, uh, and I do not by any means uh, want to disparage the work that's being done there because like so much respect to the people who are kind of doing this type of experimentation, you know, and, and the TVLs at some of these places are, you know, obviously demonstration that, you know, there, there is real belief in, in, in some of these things. But 
you know, it, it is a little bit weird to have yield paid in a coin that you can just kind of mint yourself. You know, like the 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 the, <laughs> the critiques of you know like money printer go burr, and then you're you know you see these protocols where that's exactly essentially what is happening. <laughs> like, you know, uh, I do think that. You know, in kind of traditional economics, and I'm not an economist um, at all, but um, I think that you would expect that, you know, currencies that have high interest rates um, decay over time by something like whatever the expected interest rate is. And so, you know, like in traditional markets, you know, they used to talk a lot about, you know, the carry trade, uh, you know, like 10, 15 years ago, where you could borrow yen for free and invest in like South African real estate at 15 or 20 percent or South African bonds or something like that. When in actuality, what that expressed was the fact that, you know, the, the South African rand was going to decay at a faster rate in terms of value than, than the yen. So I think that what we're seeing in some of these pools are really, um, it, it's not a surprise, you know, that you see these kind of large APYs, but actually it's decaying over time. And, you know, the, 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 the things that you're talking about in terms of the complexity, I think is a real, uh, is a real danger, you know, because, you know, if you think about what some of these protocols do, and, and again, not to criticize them, because I think the experimentation is really fascinating and will yield some really useful and valuable products over time. But, you know, like, when you talk about, like, slicing things up into tranches and then trying to monetize different tranches. Like, you know, when you talk about the curve wars and VE, uh, VECRV and then, you know, uh, you know, posting them to, to convex and all this other stuff. Like, essentially what you're doing is slicing things up and trying to add value to, uh, to the tranches in a differentiated way, which is very similar conceptually. And maybe I'm over, uh, overstating this here, but is, conceptual, uh, is conceptually similar to what happened before the great financial crisis in terms of asset-backed securities. You know, so you would take these bonds and then you would slice them up into like CDSs, or uh, sorry, CDOs, and then you would have CDO squared where like, and then what ends up happening is that you have this market and you're trying essentially to price lots of different things that are represent claims on, this, on the same underlying, which, which creates this weird, so I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the Gaussian uh, Coppola formula. Coppola formula. So this was. A <laughs> Even if I had, I would be lying if I said I understood it. So yeah, yeah. no, take no. Away. <laughs> uh, again, Gaussian Coppola formula. So what it was was it, it was created kind of in the early 2000s, and it was a way to express um, the correlations between different. Uh, I think between different default probabilities within like a basket of assets. The, the TLDR is that what it did is it tried to express the riskiness of different assets relative to each other, but in a simple, like you spit it out as a number. And if you understood, like if that's all you understood and you didn't understand how it worked, then what it enabled was people to feel overconfident that their portfolio was completely hedged. And so what happened was that people would continue to slice, they would put plug into the formula, and they would say, oh, look, you know, I am fully hedged in the event of downturns. When, and when the downturn kind of happened, then everybody was over leveraged or had, or had underpriced the risk. Um, and, you know, uh, I think it created a lot of, um, it, it created a lot of unnecessary overconfidence in whether or not, you know, in, in, the, in people's positions. And I think that we are seeing the same thing now, weirdly happening in DeFi, which was kind of originally designed to be a trustless system. Like you have people who essentially have created brands um, or trust, and people kind of flock to these people because they say, oh, these people are deep thinkers, so the structure that they have created must be a good one. And then when things kind of fall apart, um, you know, you, you recognize that, oh, well, it's, I didn't actually understand what it was, but I was following somebody. And so, you know, you do have this reliance on trust, which is really, really hard to disintermediate, actually. You know, like, it's easy to do it on a small scale, but it's really, really, really hard to do it uh, kind of on a large scale. So I think this is, oh my God, I th so I think this is a really interesting comparison. Um, 
but I will admit I don't fully understand it. So I actually just want to go deeper on the okay. like VE and curve and convex and like how you're comparing that to CDOs and just the great financial crisis and like slicing them up. Can you just like explain again for the small brain like me, like what, how, what, what is that comparison? What is the analogy there? So there's no question that there is a tremendous amount of complexity and some of it is additive and some of it is, uh, it, it can be a little bit scary. So like if we look at what happened with Frog Nation, right? Like so much respect to what, you know, Danny's been building over, you know, over the course of years. Um, and, uh, but, you know, there was a point at which it looked like the Wonderland Treasury is at risk. And you could draw a line to something like Terra depegging. And Terra depegging would be a massive, massive, massive event in, in the crypto space, right? But in order to draw that line, you'd have to go through multiple steps. Like you'd have to go through, you know, to, to Anchor and then, you know, some Terra, and then you'd have to go to Luna and then you go to Terra, things like that. So, it, so people are building these relationships on top of each other, you know, and, some, and a lot of it is being done for a reason. But for a lot of users, who look at it and just try to look at it based on like APY or something like that, or you know who invest because they you know they trust somebody who is involved in the project or anything like that, they are not necessarily aware of how the risks are um, how the risks are correlated throughout this chain. Mm. And so, essentially, what happened in the CDS case is that. Um, they were taking these asset-backed securities and slicing them in, in terms of riskiness. So, like, essentially, you would say that, oh, we sold this por uh, portfolio of mortgages, um, but we're going to take, you know, a slice that we think is the highest rated and most likely to get paid back, you know, and make, you know, and, and sell this off in one piece. And then, you know, and then the yields would be kind of reflect how risky these things were. So, like on the safest tranche, you would not get paid very much, but you know on the riskiest tranche, you would get much higher yields. And then you would kind of then you had CDO squared, which is kind of derivatives of of, of the structure. Um, but they were all kind of referenced the underlying basket of securities, and so it was unclear whether or not there was some if you were buying things because you were looking for yield at a time when yields were low, it, were, it looked like you know the yield in your bank account was getting lower. The risks were, uh, there was actually a lot, the risks were not, it, were not independent. Like it, in, in, a, in a perfect world, like a CDS, like you would think that if you bought the top tranche, you know, if the bottom tranche, uh, tranche uh, like they all defaulted on their mortgages and walked away, like you would be protected. But it turns out that they were not independent in the sense that the chance of, you know, one person defaulting is very different than the chain than the than like the entire housing market causing you know some stress and the whole the housing market i think was structured in a really really scary way and we can kind of <laughs> dig into that later but um, <laughs> um because i think that there was a, just a massive underpricing of risk throughout the entire system that caused the whole thing to break down or the over leveraging or however you want to talk about it um so I don't know that that's the right comparison because I think that when you create derivatives of derivatives, you know, you create convex off of V curve and, and things like that, and then you create V CVX and blah, blah, blah. like the, each of the individual steps might make sense, but I think that you have to be really careful about looking through and seeing how correlated the risks are to some kind of uh, to, to a single event. And I don't know if anyone's doing that. That's really interesting. Basically what you're talking about here is um, cascading correlated chaos is what I kind of call it, which is the oh, in traditional capital markets, what's been happening over the last couple of decades is that you're speeding up the rate of this cascading correlated chaos. I need to figure out a better way to a better, <laughs> a shorter way to put that. Maybe it's just cascading chaos. But like, if you think about, um, just how it works in like cap, traditional capital markets, like when there is this cascading chaos, there are tr things in place that prevent it from 
tear, tearing everything down, right? Like if you think about like um, inequities, right? They're like circuit breakers. And what, the, what a circuit breaker is, is like it's a prevention on the cascading chaos. And in when things get really, really bad, like the global financial crisis, the cascading chaos was was stopped by the, uh, you know, by quantitative easing and like by people stepping in and bailing people out, bailing out the banks and things like that. In crypto, those systems maybe don't exist yet, right? Where and, it, and you could see it getting really, really ugly. Like when the when wormhole got, got hacked for 120,000 ETH, my thought is that, holy shit, this is scary because the cascading chaos factor or multiplier is is 100x faster than it is in traditional capital markets, right? So when wormhole happened, I was like, okay, so since all the ETH on Solana just went to zero, how quickly until all the AMMs get drained, right? How long until the lending protocols are under collateralized? Um, yeah. And that becomes really scary. And obviously, yeah. and maybe we have our own version of the Fed, which is the market makers, because <laughs> jump, jump, <laughs> jumped in and uh, and uh, bailed out wormhole. But uh, so maybe, maybe just nothing's different. We're just building the same system. But anyways, I I, I think it is an interesting uh, analogy that you draw. I think I need to think about that more. Yeah, I mean, the wormhole thing was fascinating. And I agree there. You know, I think that you know, the, the simple statement is that we're not well attuned to systemic risk. Um, and again, you know, I, I can't stress this enough. Like, I do not think that this is a likely scenario. Like, I do think that these are kind of tail events. And, you know, maybe the capital is dispersed enough that it doesn't actually represent a systemic risk. But certainly in that case, it was very, very clear that you now had uncollateralized wrapped ETH on Solana. Every single you know, protocol or, or, you know, program that used wrapped ETH and Solana was now backed by nothing and is very clear to see like, oh, that means this is gone, this is gone, this is gone, this is gone. Um, right. And so, and just how uh, quickly it can happen is faster than ever before. And there are no circuit breakers, right? right? Because it's decentralized, but there are these un, un, uh, the, the unintended consequences, right, of some of these systems is sure. like, oh, maybe circuit breakers are actually nice sometimes. So yeah, I mean, I, and under uh, you know unintended circumstances, like yes, they got wormhole got bailed out, um, the ETH was replenished, but you know one of the things that came up a lot in the Great Financial Crisis is this idea of moral hazard. Like, okay, if we rescue this, you know, which is why they kind of eventually allowed Lehman to to fail. Um, if we rescue this, does this encourage bad behavior in the future? Like, I think that you can make a claim that, you know, you would expect now every product on on Solana to be back uh, to be bailed out if anything happened. Um, yeah. And you know, in some ways, that might encourage people to you know be less attuned to risks. I, like, and I, like I said, like I, I think that what what happened was really, really, really important. Um, and so, you know, in a lot of ways, Solana and that, that whole ecosystem was massively benefited by what happened. But, um, you know, if, if you are obsessed about tail events like, you know, that like trading firms tend to be, then, you know, it is certainly one of the things that we have to consider now. Yeah. I want to start to close the podcast on actually these tail events. And okay. um, actually one thing I want to get your, your opinion on here. So maybe we can close it on some of this kind of stuff uh, is... Right. We've been talking about financial markets this whole time, right? We spent, just spent an hour talking about fi- traditional capital markets and, and DeFi and just financial markets and the innovation upon financial markets. You make it sound One so thing exciting. that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think it's been a good right. podcast. I don't know. I'm super biased because uh, I, I have to say that, but I think it's been a good show so far, Tom. So, but, but one thing that I think is interesting about crypto is you're creating financial markets around mm-hmm. things that have never had financial markets before, right? Mm-hmm. So if you look at something like uh, NFTs, NFTs are gonna, going to increase the size of the art market by a thousand X, right? Um, if you look at like music, right? Music has never, like if you wanted to make a bet on music, um, you kind of just like maybe bought Spotify stock or like, I, I, I don't know. I don't really know how you had made a bet on music, but soon we're gonna get music NFTs and that's gonna be a massive industry. Uh, if you wanted to bet on like a creator, like if you want to go like long Kim Kardashian, I don't know how you could have really done that, but soon we'll get social tokens, right? And so you're creating these financial markets around everything and things that have never had financial markets around them. Mm-hmm. What are the, how do you view this? Does this seem like a good idea to you? Does this seem like a bad idea? Does this seem like both a great idea and a horrible idea at the same time? What is your view on just on, on just creating financial markets around things that maybe have never had financial markets around them? 
one of the the big soul searching kind of uh, processes that people are going through now is this idea of what has value, you know. And, and I think that, you know, uh, maybe uh, you could make the analogy that Web two has identified very clearly that personal data has value in a way that maybe people were not well attuned to before. And I think one of the probably pretty persuasive, uh, or at least to, to me, arguments is the idea of attention being valuable. Like, you know, how do you monetize people's attention? Um, and I think that that might be persuasive. And so to the extent that you can actually monetize people's engagement, um, I think that uh, is potentially very interesting. Like, certainly, the, you know, there's exciting stuff happening in NFTs, at least in the art and music NFTs, in terms of creators being able to monetize like future uh, transactions and things like that. Um, and certainly, we've seen lots of things like fan tokens, like you know all of the the, the European football clubs and things like that. Um, and I think that there have been efforts to do this before, like. You know, I, I seem to weakly recall like 10, 15 years ago, there were places where you could kind of buy uh, football teams or players or anything else. And it wasn't backed by anything, but it was just like, oh, I think that people are, you know, like, I see this guy, he's 19 years old. I think he's going to be like... Right, they created player. a market around it. Yeah, yeah. Does it add value to the world to create market? You've, you've spent the last 20 years in creating efficient markets, creating markets around everything and being a source of liquidity around pretty much any sort of like financial asset. Does it add value to the world to create more efficient markets around more things? Well, I think if you make the claim that one of the great, um, the great benefits that, you know, that, that crypto and, and DeFi and everything else has created is the democratization of finance. Like certainly you, there were tangible uh, examples of like celebrities being worth something. Like you would read a story about how somebody paid, you know, some singer or some band like X amount of dollars to perform at their wedding or like some bar mitzvah or whatever. And so in a lot of ways, that was the cost of access, but it had to be done all at once and kind of in a chunk. And I do think that the idea of, uh, of, of, of allowing access to less people who have kind of banded together, I think is pretty interesting. Um, you know, I think Cameo is probably an example of, of this. Like, what would you be, be willing to pay for some interaction with somebody? Like, essentially, how much are you willing to pay for somebody's attention? And then pe some people's attention is worth more than others. Um, but uh, it, it's a hard one for me. It, does it add value? I don't know. But I'm interested to see. Uh, uh, it doesn't add value on an institutional scale, but from an individual standpoint, I think it's really it's really interesting. I'm, I'm curious. Mm. What do you think? Um, I think it basically increases the highs and, and makes the lows much lower. Um, and I guess what I mean by mm. that is it's going to increase leverage in the system. Um, let me, I haven't actually spoke this out loud. I'm trying to almost explain this thesis oh, in real this. time, which, it, which yeah. is that, uh, no, it's a dangerous game. I, don't, I really don't <laughs> no, recommend no, it. No. <laughs> like, let's take social tokens, for example. Okay. Um, let's say that I issue, let's say that I issue a thousand, let's say that I have social tokens where I'm just me, like Jason Yano, it's, and buy people, take and them. yeah, take them, take them, you're <laughs> buying. And um, things start going really well for me, right? And the price of my token starts going up. But I need access to liquidity. I need I need some dollars, right? Maybe I'm buying a home uh, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And so I'm going to what I'm going to do is I'm going to I just got access to more money than I have ever had access to before because these social tokens exist and because people are buying my social tokens. Um, yeah. well, and so that's really cool. Like it increased the upside um, because I can maybe take out the financialization of these social tokens, which we're by the way we're just starting to see with NFTs. Means the upside is going to be even higher for me if I could have gotten from one dollar to ten dollars. Now I'm going from ten dollars to fourteen dollars. But yep. on the in the case that something really bad happens, I mean, God forbid this ever happens, but like something happens, like there's a there's a there's a some I don't know something happens to me or like something I, I do yeah. something bad or I tweet something bad or something like that instead yeah. of just my reputation going down now my financial and like maybe which will usually hit like my financial assets somehow uh it's yeah. going to increase 
the leverage on that uh, because I financialized my reputation, <laughs> right? And yeah. you're starting to see, I think you're going to see something similar with NFTs. Like NFTs, I mean, I've been really surprised. I obviously love the NFT space. I think it's going to be massive. I've been surprised to see how long it's going. Like January just had its biggest uh, we just had our biggest NFT month in history, right? I did not see that coming in January. I thought we were going to go down uh, to start the year. Your uh, the, one of the big trends of Q1 this year is like the financial financialization of NFTs is rolling out. Like Genesis is now accepting NFTs as collateral. To me, yep. that's uh, really really cool. That's but that's also incredibly dangerous, and it reminds me almost of uh, like back in 2017. The thing that popped the 2017 bubble was uh, not speculation or anything like that. It was the fact that ICOs had raised so much money in Ethereum and then they needed US dollars, which the yeah. system that we live in still needs US dollars. So people were start were forced to start selling their ETH for US dollars or tr the, the ICO treasuries were. And that caused the 2017 bubble to pop was, was ICO selling their ETH treasuries. And if you look at like, you could make the comparison to just today, like NFTs getting financialized. And if people are at some point going to need or going to want probably USDC um, or US dollars or ETH, probably honestly ETH, and they're going to start selling their NFTs and that's going to, and then the price is going to go down and that's going to cause a cascading effect. And if we've levered up the NFTs and like created financialization around NFTs, uh, that just, that's just a slippery slope and it makes it worse. All that being said, I do think we I do think we should have financialization of all of these assets because I think more liquid markets are better in general. But that's my real time thesis. Love it. I mean, you talk about small brain. Uh, you know, this is not small brain thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that. So we have seen this in in markets before, in in traditional markets before. Like, but mostly they have been securitized either versus. Um, future earnings or some sort of past uh, work. And so I think the first one that I ever heard of was um, Frank Thomas. Uh, I think he issued bonds based on kind of his future earnings. And this may Frank Thomas, been, like the, like the, the, uh, the baseball player? Yeah. yeah. Nice. <laughs> Northwest baseball player. And you saw that with Dave Bowie and, and um, the Big Hurt. And, oh, the Big Hurt. Yeah, that's right. I grew up in Chicago. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's part of it. He's me. great. He's a um, yeah, big guy. Unfortunately, I was a Cubs fan, but man, mm -hmm. Frank Thomas was the best. Um, but yeah, it, you know, and we've certainly seen lots of transactions recently where people are buying like past music catalogs of, of, of pretty significant artists. And so if it is securitized, I think that the risk is contained. Um, but I, I agree. Like, uh, you know, how do you monetize reputation? That's a really hard one. Uh, I, you know... <laughs> There are, you know, I mean, if you think about it, if you squint the right way, then like uh, credit rating agencies, like that is, you know, a, a way of securitizing, you know, reputation in some way. I mean, obviously there's lots of maths and, you know, balance sheet and all this other stuff that goes into it. But um, yeah, oh, I don't know. It's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's something to think about. Um, as we, I'm sure this won't be the last time. Also, it's been cool. I, uh, I'm just watching the London sky get darker and darker behind you. Um, I also love like the the cars just look better in, in London. So I've been joyfully watching like the buses and the and the taxi cabs go by. So it's been quite an enjoyable oh, experience. Did you see the church? <laughs> you went through the church. Oh, there's you. But <laughs> oh, nice. There's me. Yeah, there's me in the in the window. So, Tom, this has been this has been an awesome conversation. Um, I'm yeah, sure this no, won't be the last time. I would leave you to think about just the financialization of these NFTs and social tokens and, and what are the unintended consequences of that. I think that's an interesting way to uh, leave this leave this show. Yeah. And once you issue Yano coins, let me know so I can get in on the first uh, distribution. <laughs> oh, by the way, Tom, I disagree with one thing that you said earlier in this podcast about governance mm. and DAOs, which is... Governance is one of the, le you said governance is like so interesting with DAOs. Governance is one of the least interesting things about DAOs, in my opinion. <laughs> really? Go okay. DAO, go DAO governance is horrible. I don't know how many DAOs you participated in. It's a nightmare. Governance is the least interesting thing about DAOs. What's interesting about DAOs is that we are moving to a remote first, global first world. LLCs and C-Corps are not built to do that. DAOs yeah. are just going to be the new company structure. Five years from now, if five years from now, people aren't like entrepreneurs, especially young entrepreneurs will never, they won't start C-Corps. They, they won't start LLCs. They'll, they'll just start DAOs, but DAOs don't, 
I'm just I'm getting frustrated because DAOs don't need to be a, about governance. Like you look at the MakerDAO proposal that Parify proposed. It's like this massive proposal to like basically create like VE Maker. You know how many votes are on that thing? It's like twelve, or like fifteen. <laughs> like no, nobody's voting, and that that's how society works. It's like the top, the like one percent right. of people care enough to vote. So any, anyways, and gets me. Wrong. And that's why I think that it's not the fact that it works well. It's like this experiment on whether or not this is a good governance model. Because I think a lot of people, when they created, they said, okay. This, you know, crypto, DeFi crypto is the democratization of uh, access of finance and everything else. Um, and so we're going to create this, uh, you know, this this model that is going to, you know, to run, you know, these projects. And I agree, like the level of engagement in DAOs can be, uh, I, I think that there is some really, really, uh, you know, again, if you look at it as an experiment, I think it's a fascinating experiment. Whether or not it yeah. is a good governance model, I think is... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I guess just like ever, everyone is trying to say, create, I don't know if you will like get these, uh, if Jane Street sees these, like all, all these companies are raising for like DAO tooling and a big focus, like slide number two is like, we're going to increase the amount of DAO members who are voting. And like, that just doesn't line up with my, how I view society and what I think will happen. Instead, it's a better use of time to be like, great, there are a thousand members probably 950 of them are never going to vote. How can we use their tokens where they can vote for members inside of the community to actually, and then those people are, vote, are the voters, which by the way is what the US, the US does, which is democracy, but um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, this model exists though in crypto, like the delegating of stakes um, to delegators, like that, you know, yeah. if, if you provide enough incentive, uh, it, so whether it's a question of kind of fundamental human nature or a question of, uh, of getting the right incentives, I think, you know, that's another <laughs> discussion. Like, this is a yeah. very interesting place to, to actually run experiments and figure that out. Yeah, totally. Well, Tom, we will have to do this again soon. Um, I hope to uh, see you in person soon for, uh, for a couple of beers in London. And uh, until then, my friend, be oh, well. Indeed. Thanks again for coming on the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it May? April. Permissionless. Uh, we've yeah. got permissionless May 17th or 19th. So excited, uh, excited to have you on stage. Jane Street will be out in force at permissionless. Good. You know, we just it. booked a uh, we just booked a big pool party location. So uh, <laughs> I, I feel like that's right up. If Jane Street wants to sponsor, by the way, I feel like that's a real Jane Street thing to do is sponsor the pool party. <laughs> a liquidity pool, a deep liquidity pool. The li <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. That's great. All right, Tom. Be well. Thanks again for coming on. And I'll talk to you soon. Okay, see ya.